went to past this, but I'll just skip back to this one if that's okay, uh, and pick up here. Uh, this is the part that we didn't finish last time, uh, talking mostly about sleep and its role in cognition. Um, so this is, is slide 19. Uh, it should be in that packet. Okay. So, uh, why do we sleep? Uh, as we talked about the last time, sleep is clearly present among all animal, mammals and birds. And then even fish and amphibians and reptiles show at least aspects of sleep. Uh, so <coughs> we talked about how uh, behaviors that are seen in a broader context are highly likely to have some kind of functional benefit. Uh, for instance, behaviors that are seen across uh, humanity, that are seen at different times and places among different social and ethnic groups, are highly likely to be functional behaviors. If you're seeing a behavior replicated across a wide range of animals, that's, an, again, a really strong indicator that there's a reason for the behavior being present. Um, and I'm going to present at least two major reasons why sleep is likely to be important and functional. The first one has to do with resting. Um, so part of what seems to be going on has to do with allowing the brain to rest. And that seems to be achieved by slow wave sleep. Uh, so remember we talked about uh, stage one, two, three, and four of sleep last time. And slow wave sleep is the latter uh, stages of sleep uh, with the very low frequencies uh, of, um, of brain activity. Uh, and so slow wave sleep allows the brain to rest. Uh, so contributing to this are some adaptations that we have observed in animals, uh, in particular dolphins, uh, ducks, horses, <coughs> and a few other animals are adapted to allow one cerebral hemisphere at a time to shut down. Uh, and so they really literally sleep with one eye open uh, because the cerebral hemispheres, of course, control the contralateral eye, right? We've been talking about before. And so the hemisphere that's shut down shuts the eye on the other side down as well. Uh, but the one eye remains open to detect predators uh, in particular or uh, monitor safety. Uh, and so they're able to shut half of the brain down at a time, um, kind of similar to what happens to humans when we do, we do the WADA test uh, in epilepsy, uh, but it's actually done spontaneously by the animal. Uh, and so dolphins and these dogs and so forth, they're kind of always awake, uh, half a brain at a time, uh, and then many times they're awake, their whole brain, but when they go to sleep, just half of the brain goes to sleep at a time. Um, and if they do detect a threat, then the other half of the brain can wake up the sleeping half of um, as far as humans are concerned, uh, what sleep and rest seem to be, what we seem to know about them is, first of all, that sleep does not appear to be primarily related to resting the body outside of the brain. It really seems to be resting the brain that is happening here. Uh, and so one piece of evidence that contributes to that is that physical activity actually does not have, this may seem a little counterintuitive, does not really have a strong impact on the amount of slow wave sleep that's needed, or sleep that's needed in general. Uh, very strenuous days may lead to slightly more solid sleep. You might get a little bit of extra sleep. But in general, you know, if you're twice as active, you're not having a vast increase in the number of hours that you're sleeping. Uh, and those of you who are very physically active with athletics or exercise, you know that you're not sleeping 10 or 12 hours instead of 7 or 8 hours. The need that you have for sleep is pretty similar to everyone else. Uh, so it's really only the brain that uh, is being rested in sleep. The other thing that tells us that it's probably the brain that's resting during sleep is this inverse relationship. The structures that have the strongest activation, uh, the structures that are using the most metabolic resources, uh, renal cerebral blood flow uh, in, in the fMRI uh, modalities, this is where is the blood going in the brain. The places where the blood goes in the brain the most, the places where there's a highest level of blood flow, are picking up more metabolites from the blood uh, and picking up more uh, oxygen. And so they're using more energy. Uh, those structures that are using the most, most energy when they're awake are also the structures that have the strongest delta pattern when they're asleep and the lowest cerebral blood flow when they're asleep. And so the structures that are being used the most actively are also being slept the most uh, thoroughly, in essence. And so that again tells us that the structures that are active seem to be resting and recuperating during sleep, during slow wave sleep in particular. So that's the first uh, reason we sleep, to rest. 
And the resting is really specific to the brain, and it's really specific to uh, relatively active portions of the brain, and it happens during slow wave sleep. In addition to resting, there's also an active process during sleep that's not rest oriented, uh, and that happens during REM sleep, as you probably know. Uh, and REM sleep appears to be very important for cognitive reorganization, um, meaning the information that you experience during, during REM sleep, first of all, if you remember your dreams, you know that they're not purely random. They, they have patterned and themed content. Uh, people who have certain kinds of experience have recurrent dreams, like after a uh, traumatic event, you may have recurrent dreams. Uh, if you have uh, stress in your life, you may have certain kinds of pattern dreams that relate to your stress. If you have other kinds of experience, those experiences may show up in your dreams. So the way that we want to understand the dreams is probably not, generally speaking, the kind of uh, model that Freud had in his dream interpretation. We're actually not, in neuropsychology and biopsychology, we're not so interested in interpreting dreams generally, but I do want to stress that the information that they contain is patterned, and that pattern does occur for a reason. That reason probably has to do with cognitive reorganization. So we talked briefly when we were talking about learning and memory about the idea of eidetic memories. So young children and people in general have the ability to store information uh, in a purely sensory format, like uh, photographic memory. Those photographic memories are relatively inefficient. Uh, it takes a lot of neural activity to store that information, uh, and it's hard to extract meaning from it. Most of our memories are highly meaning-oriented. So part of what's going on during dreaming is allowing you to extract meaning from patterns of sensory uh, and, for that matter, motor functions and experiences that you have. You extract meaning, then you can compact the information down. You can understand the gist of it. You can store it more efficiently. And at least part of that process seems to happen during REM sleep. Uh, and there's some evidence supporting this idea that uh, reorganization of cognitive information uh, is happening during REM sleep. Uh, first of all, REM is highly active uh, cognitively, but the brain is highly active during sleep. And so first of all, it's kind of hard to explain why a state that would involve a high level of brain activity would be there for rest. Uh, there must be some reason why the brain is highly active during sleep. As sleep deprivation occurs, interestingly, more and more time is diverted to REM sleep. This is potentially relevant because we know in other contexts, the brain will um, uh, take care of itself before it takes care of the rest of the body. So for instance, uh, with energy metabolite resources, the brain gets preferential access to those. So for instance, for the basic sugars, the brain only allows other parts of the body, like the muscles, to act, gain access to those when the brain has plenty itself. And it can shunt access away from other parts of the body to itself. So, the same kind of thing seems to happen with REM sleep. With whatever is active during REM, it seems to be important enough to the brain that as sleep deprivation occurs, the amount of time you sleep doesn't increase, but that sleep is diverted to REM sleep. Um, other pieces of information are that REM correlates with neural development. Uh, so during periods of high neuromatur neuronal maturation, uh, there's lots of REM sleep. And as neural, neuronal maturation uh, stabilizes, the REM sleep uh, decreases in relative proportion. So for example, in animals, animals born with well-developed brains show less REM sleep in early childhood. Animals born with very relatively limited prenatal brain development show much more REM sleep. So humans, for instance, are animals that have a relatively high neuronal development after birth, postnatally. And so humans have a lot of REM sleep. Uh, during infancy. Uh, and then that as the brain matures, the REM sleep percentage goes down over time. <coughs> uh, so those are slightly hand-waving arguments, but there are some there are a number of other arguments that suggest that cognitive reorganization is what's happening during sleep. Um, and sleep does appear to have some interesting relationships with memory. Uh, in particular, you know, memory, these, these are the things that are being remembered that are being reorganized. Uh, so, first of all, um, the counterintuitive relationship. So, during REM sleep, consciousness is relatively high. Um, 
We talked about declarative and non-declarative memories. The declarative memories were the ones where there was a specific experience, um, a specific thing happened, uh, like episodic memory. The non-declarative memories were things like procedural memories where there was no, um, it couldn't be explicitly brought to consciousness. So non-declarative memories were implicitly conscious. And it might think that since REM sleep is also conscious, you would see facilitation of declarative memory during REM sleep. But actually, it seems to be the opposite. During REM sleep, it's actually non-declarative memory types that are um, uh, particularly uh, facilitated in terms of their consolidation. Uh, and um, there is some evidence that the activation, the activation of the brain correlates with the kinds of things that are consolidated. So for instance, um, hippocampal activation for route navigation, which is route navigation is a declarative memory, um, happened during slow wave sleep and not during REM sleep. Uh, and so slow wave sleep facilitates consolidation of declarative memories. And in slow wave sleep, consciousness is low. So this is kind of a backwards pattern. Um, and so it's not the fact that REM sleep that's con is conscious that allows memory to be consolidated because it's not conscious memories that are being consolidated during REM sleep. Uh, it's the fact that uh, these non-conscious act activities are optimized in such a way that the memories can be consolidated. Um, so here's that graphically. Um, so um, here's a non-declarative task. And um, this is a person who didn't nap. Um, and then a person who was allowed to nap just long enough to have slow wave sleep only. And then a person who was allowed to nap long enough to have slow wave sleep and REM sleep. And you see the non-declarative task uh, which does not involve conscious processing, was best during the condition, the improvement was best during the condition that had the REM sleep. Um, if you purposely created a condition where uh, napping was too short to have REM, you see that there's uh, um, improvement in declarative learning and there's no improvement in non-declarative learning over not having a nap. So what you want to see here is that non-declarative learning, which is uh, unconscious learning uh, or subconscious learning, which is facilitated by REM sleep, was not improved as a result of having a nap. It was too short to have REM sleep. But declarative learning that involves conscious memory that is facilitated by slow wave sleep, which happens before REM sleep, was improved by this shorter nap in comparison to the waking performance. So basically, um, slow wave sleep and REM sleep both contribute to learning, but REM sleep in particular seems to be important for non-declarative memory types, and so uh, procedural memory uh, and other kinds of memory that are not declarative. Um, so that's memory, and that's sleep and cognition. Um, the short point is there are active processes during sleep that are aiding cognition. Uh, and most of the disadvantages of not sleeping appear to be cognitive. So if you do, if you are sleep deprived, most of the negative impacts are cognitive, they're not physical. You don't um, lose your motor skills when you don't sleep. You don't lose your ability to balance or coordinate you primarily lose information processing kinds of cognitive skills. Okay, so sleep is controlled uh, chemically by the brain. Um, and uh, the evidence uh, that waking behaviors affect sleep suggests that there's a regulation process. And when we talk about the uh, reproductive chapter, or I'm sorry, when we talk about the eating chapter, we're gonna continue talking about these regulatory processes, uh, but what I mean by that is, in order for what's happening while you're awake to affect sleep, there must be some residual effect of what you, whatever it was that you did during your, while you were awake. Because the behavior that's being affected is occurring at a different time than the behavior that's causing the effect. That's what I mean by a regulatory process. So something here is causing a downstream effect in sleep. Uh, and that something seems to be at least in part related to adenosine a neuromodulator, 
Uh, and so adenosine, um, which is uh, an amino acid, um, seems to play a significant role. And um, the um, and that uh, adenosine uh, inhibits neural activity and leads to slow wave sleep. And so the role that adenosine plays essentially is um, is in, in introducing sleep. Um, glycogen is required for brain energy consumption. It's stored by astrocytes. They're stocked by astrocytes. I mean, these are glial cells, and glycogen is um, an energy source. Decreasing glycogen available introduces adenosine to the extracellular medium, uh, and then adenosine inhibits neural activity, leading to slow wave sleep. So when you have lots of glycogen, it's available for energy. As that glycogen level goes down, then adenosine starts being excreted into the extracellular medium. The adenosine inhibits neural activity, which is a feedback because the higher the neural activity, the more of the glycogen you need. And then as neural activity goes down, then ultimately sleep results. So during slow wave sleep, neural activity is low, glycogen is not depleted, the astrocytes have a chance to replenish the amount of glycogen. So you've got glycogen, it's high. You use it by running neurons. It drops down. When it drops down, it releases adenosine. Adenosine shuts the neurons down. That causes sleep. The glycogen level goes back up. Glycogen levels are high. You use them to fuel neurons. It goes down. That causes the release of adenosine. The adenosine inhibits neural activity and so on. So it's a, that's the loop, basically, where adenosine is causing um, sleep and wake. That makes sense. So we mentioned already that adenosine uh, receptors are blocked by some things we know, and caffeine is one of them. So I said that adenosine receptors um, inhibit neural activity, and uh, that causes sleepiness. And caffeine promotes wakefulness by blocking adenosine receptors, which is also consistent with the fact that can, caffeine acts as a stimulant, makes you think a little bit more clearly or better, at least in small doses. So adenosine inhibits neural activity blocking adenosine, remember the idea of uh, antagonizing an antagonist. So if adenosine antagonizes neural activity and you block adenosine or you antagonize adenosine, the net effect is positive, just like in the uh, diagrams we did for the basal ganglia. And so caffeine actually in increases neural activity. Um, adenosine is also enzym enzymatically deactivated. Remember this concept uh, in the context of um, um, I think, was it dopamine in the, in the exam? Uh, so it's broken down by an enzyme. And um, there is actually uh, a fast and a slow variant of the enzyme for adenosine uh, breakdown. Uh, and um, there are different alleles on the gene code that uh, code for uh, the enzymes that break adenosine down quickly and slowly. Uh, and People with the slow breakdown enzyme have more available, and therefore, since adenosine inhibits sleep, they have more deep sleep. I mean, sorry, since adenosine inhibits neural activity and encourages deep sleep, slow wave sleep, they have more deep sleep, the people who have the slow breakdown enzyme. This is sort of like the serotonin reuptake inhibitor. The serotonin reuptake inhibitor keeps the serotonin from being taken back into the cell. This inhibition, the slow, Enzymatic process causes more uh, adenosine to remain available and bioavailable longer, and so it has a more a stronger effect. Um, in contrast, the people who have the fast uh, breakdown enzyme uh, break down their adenosine more quickly. That means all the, each amount of adenosine that's released um, has a shorter duration of effect, a shorter window, and that means that they have less deep sleep. Um, and so. In addition to caffeine, there are other actions to block the adenosine receptors that promote wakefulness. Um, other stimulants will do the same thing. So it's something you don't want to take generally in the evening. Uh, remember, adenosine is being released into the system uh, as the glycogen gets depleted as you get closer to sleeping. So if you take caffeine early during the day, then uh, there are, isn't a lot of adenosine in the system the receptors are getting blocked when they're not needed, there isn't a sleepiness effect. That's why when you have caffeine at lunch, it doesn't generally make you tired. 
Later in the day, the caffeine has gone away when the adenosine finally gets there and you sleep normally. In contrast, if you have caffeine later in the day, then it will still be bioavailable when the adenosine starts being excreted and will prevent you from sleeping. So that's chemical control of sleep. What about neural control of sleep? And so here, I want to start a pattern that will continue with the reproduction functions. We're going to talk about hormonal and neural control. By hormonal control, I mean control by chemicals that are released into the bloodstream or this extracellular fluid. Neural control, I mean uh, control that's achieved by via projection of neurons uh, and synaptic connections. So, um, being awake is not merely the absence of sleeping, right? I think you know this intuitively. You can be alert at different levels. You know, sometimes you're very alert. Sometimes you're just a little alert. And if you stop paying attention, if you stop being alert, you don't fall asleep, right? Like, if you close your eyes right now and try to stop thinking, that won't necessarily make you fall asleep. If you're tired, it might, but in general, it, it would not, right? Especially, like, if you tried that experiment at 10 o'clock in the morning or something like that, you probably would not fall asleep, right? So being awake is not merely the absence of sleeping. Sleeping is not merely the abs absence of being awake. They're both, you know, specific active behaviors. And there are some known neurotransmitter systems that play roles in arousal, it's five of them in particular. And here by arousal, I mean the kind of arousal that has to do with being alert. Um, and uh, these are going to have to do with the brainstem, uh, the hypothalamus, um, and the basal forebrain. So these five chemicals, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, serotonin, histamine, and orexin seem to be important for wakefulness. Uh, I'm also going to talk about melatonin in a moment. Uh, but these five, uh, acetylcholine uh, is pumped from the pons and from the basal forebrain. And in general, it promotes alertness in various parts of the brain. Uh, norepinephrine is pumped from the locus ceruleus in the pons. And it's also important in vigilance. Uh, and so the norepinephrine source in the locus ceruleus is active upon waking. It's not active during REM sleep. Even though during REM sleep there's high, high neural activity, this is not active. So this is at least one thing that's different about conscious behavior during waking and conscious behavior during REM sleep. Serotonin also comes from the brainstem, from the retina nuclei. And they fire during waking, and they also fire right after REM resolves. And so again, there's a, there's a sleep-wake cycle component to what serotonin does. Histamine. Uh, and the hist so histamine comes from the tubero mammillary nucleus, which is in the hypothalamus. And um, it has direct cortical functioning, and it also stimulates acetylcholine. And then finally, orexin is a large peptide neurotransmitter. It stimulates the brain, as well as all of these pumps that produce the other stimulating chemicals. And so these different chemicals interact with each other. Orexin, for instance, is a large peptide that stimulates the brain directly, but it also stimulates production of norepinephrine and serotonin, which increase alertness. <coughs> Histamine stimulates the brain directly. It also stimulates acetylcholine, which stimulates the brain. And neurons in parts of the hypothalamus, particularly in an area called the preoptic area, synapse with arousal neurons and inhibit them. So those are GABA connections, right? The primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, these cause sleep by inhibiting arousal. So sleep is not purely the absence of being awake, but what the system is doing is removing the being awake in order to be able to sleep. And lesions in this region of the hypothalamus will result in uh, substantial reductions in sleep. Um, so there's a, and so now the system is bidirectional, right? Because you need to be awake and asleep. And the way the bidirectional system works is there are reciprocal relationships between the arousal areas and the sleep areas so that the arousal areas inhibit the sleep areas and the sleep areas inhibit the arousal areas, right? And that makes sense. These should work like a pair, like the opposite arms of a scissor, pair of scissors, or your legs. Like when you move your legs, you don't walk by moving them both forward at once. You walk by moving one leg forward and then the other leg forward. You're awake when you're not asleep. You're asleep when you're not awake, right? And so these, these should have reciprocal relationships. You should be doing one or the other. Um, just like the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system have a 
a reciprocal relationship. So it works kind of like a light switch. These two, this pair of reciprocal rela inhibit inhibitory relationships. Um, so the two systems don't fire together. That wouldn't make any sense um, because you'd be inhibiting awake, being awake and asleep at the same time. So what would you have left? Rather, the state is consistent, meaning if you're awake, the um, arousal system is inhibiting the sleep system, but the sleep system is not inhibiting the arousal system. And if you're asleep, the sleep system is inhibiting the arousal system, but the arousal system is not inhibiting the sleep system. So it's just one at a time, right? And so, in this sense, you start to get a possible biological model of some sleep disorders, like the ones that cause sudden sleep episodes. The sudden sleep episodes function kind of like a hair trigger. Basically, the switch gets flipped really easily, and that causes um, the, the sudden uh, sleep attacks, like in narcolepsy. Um, orexin appears to be a stabilizing factor for the switch. Remember. Here I said that orexin, this large peptide neurotransmitter, stimulates all the pumps. So it's a good candidate for a stabilizing factor because it has a broad effect. So it keeps the switch in the awake position. And the availability of orexin during the day is maintained, is a circadian process. So as long as the orexin is available during the day, the switch is stabilized and you don't fall asleep very easily during the day. Um, and then adenosine serves as a stabilizer keeping the switch in a sleep position. So you have two reciprocal inhibiting functions, the sleep system inhibiting the arousal system and the arousal system inhibiting the sleep system. You have orexin that keeps the switch in the awake position, adenosine that keeps the switch in the sleep position. Yes? So if you don't have a normal sleep schedule, like I go to pass during the day and then like work night shift, mm -hmm. can that like mess up your neurotransmitters? Does it like throw them off? Yeah, potentially. Um, humans are adaptable, and other animals are adaptable too. Like one way that I remember adaptability with this, for me personally, is I work days, but I, I have a, a cat and a dog, right? And so my dog is a diurnal creature by nature, but my cat is a nocturnal creature by nature. But you, if you have, all have cats, you know that they will learn to sleep at night with you to make you happy, right? And so my cat sleeps at night even though my cat is nocturnal. So you can adapt to be nocturnal if you're human in, a, in the same way. You can work the night shift. The system is never going to be optimal for people who are not awake during the normal daylight hours. And in part that, going back to what we talked about before, um, in part that's because light is a stabilizing component of the system. Uh, light is what resets the circadian clock so that uh, it doesn't keep Remember we talked about how the circadian clock is 25 hours long instead of 24? The clock gets reset on a daily basis by light. And so if your system is not being regulated by light, it's not going to work as efficiently. Now, generally speaking, people who don't have um, the standard diurnal sleep-wake pattern do okay. They adapt to their pattern. The problem comes in much more when you're on something like a swing shift where you're awake like three nights a week and asleep three nights a week or four nights a week. That's when you really tend to struggle. And you struggle because these processes are not, you normally have the system that's designed to be stable in a circadian pattern, and now it's not functioning according to that pattern. Uh, and your body is strongly biased. It's a homeostatic drive, a maintenance drive, to function in this long-term stable way, which is the 24-hour day. Um, you know, if we had other situations which we don't really have, like if we went and lived on another planet where the day wasn't 24 hours long, we'd have some ability to adapt to that. But at least in the short term, until our biology caught up, our system is designed for an approximately 24 hour day. And so if you're not sleeping and waking according to that schedule, what's going to happen is it's probably going to have a subtle impact on cognition. Um, it's not going to make you a dummy, right? But it's, it's going to make you a little bit less effective, your concentration, uh, your memory and so forth, your learning skills. Um, your sleep is probably going to be a little bit more fragmented uh, because it's because sleep is designed to be stable, and the more you sleep and wake up every day at the same time, the more the system can do its job, and the more you have you know a normal uh, pattern of. Um, we go way back to this. 
So this was, you know, like the pattern that's supposed to happen for sleep, right? This is what's going to get disrupted, uh, maybe even including wakings during the night. But the REM sleep is not going to be distributed in the normal fashion, and the distribution of these different kinds of stage sleep is not going to be normal. Uh, and so that's going to reduce the, the efficacy of the sleep, basically. Um, and, you know, many people can deal with that just fine. Um, some people have a lot of trouble. Uh, probably, like, if you took, I mean, if you think about it, most of us have the luxury of working normal days, especially well-educated people like you all. It increases the chance you'll have to just have a normal day shift job, right? Like, most of the people who have night shift jobs are relatively semi-skilled laborers, have them much more commonly than we do hopefully some of us do, right? But if you work in medicine, it's more likely as well. But you know, like, so, and then you're probably like relatively also more likely to be able to do things like drive your own hours and say, I'm working nine to five, I don't feel like working evenings. You know, that's gonna allow you to have a more stable structure. But suppose that you did, if you did an experiment, and, and these have been done to some extent, where you took a large population of people and you have them do something like work the night shift instead of the day shift, or you have them work swing shifts, which is even worse, what you'll find is that some of them will handle it better than others. Um, and that goes back, actually, to um, something we talked about last time, which is here. Um, we talked about these three, this 3P model of insomnia, and one of the first P was predispos predisposing. Those are your risk factor. Um, <laughs> Your, your pre-existing risk factor, right? So we talk about that this is similar to a diathesis stress model in psychology. We all have a standing risk for any specific disorder, but then when a stressor happens, it can create a disease. The more the standing risk is, the more easily it creates the disease. So people have varying amounts of diathesis um, or susceptibility to sleep problems. What you'll find is that, suppose you took like the entire population of GVSU, like, so 40,000 people or whatever it is, and you put them all on swing shift. What you find is that some of you would tolerate it just fine, and it would have a relatively minimal impact on your cognition, and some of you would really struggle. You'd start having symptoms of insomnia, you would start having um, uh, less efficient sleep, your learning would be affected, your concentration would be affected. Um, and in fact, when you do start having these problems in sleep, it can look a lot like ADHD. So if you're familiar with ADHD, it might give you a good model of sort of what it's like to have these problems. So you find that some people would have them and some people wouldn't. Uh, and basically what that represents is that some people uh, are good sleepers, essentially. And so no, almost no matter what you do to their sleep, that shock doesn't have a big impact on them. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. um, it's probably going to be a mild effect, you know, imbalance. Most of us can survive this kind of thing fine. But some of us will struggle more than others. I, I would struggle. Uh, and that's also similar to other things, like we have normal variability in the amount of sleep you need. Like, I really don't do well if I get less than uh, eight hours of sleep. You know, some people can get by very well on five or six. That's normal variability. Some people have the ability to tolerate staying up until midnight. One night, going to bed at nine, the next night, staying up until two the next night. Some people will develop insomnia very quickly that way. It just depends on your freestanding stress level, your, your uh, diathesis level. And that diathesis is probably related, essentially, to your body's ability to regulate these systems, right? Like, these circadian processes get dysregulated when you have an unusual diurnal pattern, like if you stay up late or you go to bed early. But your body not only has these processes, but it also has internal regulation, like autoreceptors. Like, the, 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 the parts of the body that produce orexin are also monitoring how much orexin is available and self-adjusting. So they're able to fix these problems. And many times they'll fix these problems just fine, but if they're not able to self-regulate these chemicals effectively, then, then you start to see the clinical effects of, um, of the sleep variability. So orexin and adenosine stabilize the switch, which keeps you in a sleeping or waking state, it's supposed to. Um, here's a graphical look at that. And so there's an arousal system and the arousal system stimulates multiple uh, neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, serotonin, histamine. Um, and uh, there is the uh, uh, preoptic area, ventrolateral preoptic area, that's the, that, is, that presses for slow wave sleep. So 
this is the sleep promoting region, this is the waking promoting region. Uh, the sleep promoting region has an effect on orexin, orexin has an effect on the arousal system, so that's an indirect mechanism that connects the two of them. And then orexin is regulated by things like uh, the time of day, like the availability of light, uh, hunger signals, satiety signals, and orexin is important in both um, eating and sleeping. And so orexin is important in both eating and sleeping by virtue of different kinds of orexin receptors, orexin A and B receptors, but orexin is orexin. And so what this also tells you is something new, which is that since there's a common, common chemical basis, eating affects orexin, orexin affects sleep. And so orexin mediates the relationship between eating and sleep. Meaning it may be involved in things like food coma, meaning it may be involved in things like the fact that generally speaking, you're not supposed to be hungry in the middle of the night. That's you know, potentially conceptually sensible because um, orexin keeps the system in the waking position, so orexin is more available during the day when you're supposed to be awake and you're supposed to be eating. Orexin is supposed to be relatively absent during your sleep when you're not supposed to be eating. So orexin, again, will, will relate sleeping and eating. So REM sleep has zone flip-flop that involves a periaqueductal gray matter. Um, and uh, the, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so the REM sleep flip-flop, I would just want to mention basically, is a lot, allows the control of the ratio between slow wave sleep when REM is off and REM sleep. And so we talked about how um, uh, REM sleep will be increased, for instance, with sleep deprivation. So REM sleep itself is also directly affected for, by orexin. Uh, and orexin, again, is affected both by things like light availability and also by uh, things that have to do more with eating. Um, so in, in summary, these switches basically function to allow for control of sleep. And they allow for stability of that control and so that you're either awake or you're asleep and you're not constantly switching back and forth between the waking and sleeping states, uh, and that you're awake during the day and asleep at night. And also allows for control of the amount of REM sleep that we already talked about, how there's evidence that the brain is actively regulating REM sleep in order uh, to maximize its ability to help uh, with learning functions. Um, and I don't know if this is true, but you might hypothesize it would be a reasonable hypothesis. So we know that REM sleep is involved in learning non-declarative memories or consolidating them. We know that slow wave sleep is involved in learning declarative memories. It might be a valid hypothesis then that as you bias the situation to induce the different kinds of learning, that should show up in, a, in biasing the relative proportions of REM and non-REM sleep. Okay, so I mentioned circadian rhythms several times. I want to tell you a little bit more about what they are. Uh, so circadian rhythms function like the, the wristwatch of the body or the clock. And so what they do is they tell your body when they should, it should be awake and when it should be asleep. And the circadian rhythm is actually slightly off of the environment, meaning it's designed for about 25 hours in a day uh, rather than 24. But every day it gets resynchronized by light. Now, in some environments that doesn't happen, right? Like in parts of Alaska, um, it's light four days at a time and dark four days at a time. Uh, it doesn't happen as well uh, in, the, um, in the winter in Michigan, for instance, when it's dark pretty much all the time. Um, but generally speaking, light synchronizes the circadian rhythms. And it doesn't have to be sunlight. It can be artificial light. And so turning on the lights bright in the morning uh, acts essentially as a circadian rhythm resynchronizer. Um, and that's important because the circadian rhythm is slightly off, and so uh, much like the lunar calendar is different from the Gregorian calendar, uh, if you don't have this resynchronization, your sleep processes. Right? If, because this day is longer than an actual day, your sleep would get later and later or earlier and earlier every day, um, and then it would have, you, would, you would ultimately be sleeping at the wrong time of day. Um, there is a nucleus in the hypothalamus that's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That sounds really complicated, but you kind of already know what that means. The optic chiasm is the crossing of the optic 
fibers where the two optic nerves combine and some fibers cross into the two optic tracts. So this nucleus is in the hypothalamus, but it's right above the optic chiasm. That's why it's called suprachiasmatic. This nucleus regulates the circadian clock. And the suprachiasmatic nucleus has a special projection called the retinohypothalamic pathway that provides direct innervation by the vision system. Um, and so what this means is that the SCN is getting information from the vision system that doesn't go through vision processing. And in fact, um, even blind people, most of them will have this direct innervation uh, of the SCN and still have a normal sleep-wake system like um, sighted people. Uh, this input comes from a special photoreceptive melanopsin, uh, which is a chemical kind of like rhodopsin, but, uh, but with melanin. Um, and it's located in ganglion cells, not in the photoreceptors. Uh, these are the, the same ganglion cells that are involved in the opponent process vision, right? So the ganglion cells of the, specifically the ganglion cells of the retina. Um, they also project to the tectum for pupillary response to light. Uh, and so these ganglion cells do two things. They uh, allow the light, the pupil size to adjust in response to light, and they also reset the clock on the SCN every day. So the circadian clock works by production, accumulation, and destruction of a protein that sort of functions like the sand in an hourglass. What I mean by that is this protein produces, 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 and accumulates, and eventually it gets too much. That triggers a process that starts to destroy it. It gets, uh, the amount gets diminished, diminished, diminished until there's too little. That triggers a process to produce it. It gets built back up. Um, that actually is very similar to what we just talked about in terms of uh, the relationship between adenosine and glycogen, right? It's a feedback loop between two, between this protein and, and a regulating system. Um, and so the circadian clock works by this protein. It's regulated uh, and reset on a daily basis by melanopsin from the, um, the, uh, 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 ganglion cells of the retina. So this is a picture of what, schematically, what I mean by that protein hourglass. So this particular protein enters the nucleus and suppresses the gene responsible for, I'm sorry, let me not start there. So you've got this protein and it's being made by, uh, by an RNA process in the nucleus of the cell. Uh, and, um, uh, sorry, we'll hold on a second. That is, um, that's here, this one. So you got this, this protein that's being made. Once the protein level gets very high, there starts to be more accumulation of the protein in the nucleus. Uh, the protein's presence in the nucleus impacts the gene that, re that creates the protein, and so it shuts the RNA down. And that causes the protein to stop being made. This, there's a garbage keeping process, so the protein gets deactivated over time. So the levels fall. Once the levels fall too low, um, a very low level of proteins in the nucleus no longer are available to inhibit the, the gene production of the protein, so the protein production starts again and the process continues. Uh, and this process is essentially like an hourglass, which is you know a simple kind of clock or watch that keeps your body going. This is an hourglass that's built essentially to have enough sand in it to work for 24, 25 hours. So the um, SCN, is that master clock, and it has a number of projections that are active during the active phase, during the waking phase, so during the day for most humans. Those include inhibitory projections to the preoptic area that inhibit sleep, and excitatory outputs to arexinergic neurons that promote wakefulness. So again, in this prior model, arexin stimulates the arousal system, produces all these other, uh, the, uh, catecholamines and indolamines and so forth um, keeps you awake through orexin. Orexin is, pr is produced in response to stimulation from the SCN. Um, so it's all consistent still. Uh, and there's also inhibition of, direct inhibition of the sleep area. So the SCN is controlling the orexin and the orexin is keeping the sleep-wake switch stable. And studies in rodents show tissue can be grafted back into the brain and still works in this area, meaning that it's a neurosecretory component that does this 
at least in part, and it doesn't require any tech projections. Let me explain what I mean by this. Um, so suppose that you've got tissue that functions via projections to another part of the brain or body. Like a good example is your primary motor cortex, right? Your primary motor cortex is, is uh, projecting down uh, through the brain stem, through the spine, synapsing in a motor neuron that's, that's then firing on a, fi a muscle fiber, uh, that uh, neuromuscular junction that we talked about. So if you cut that, like if you lesion out a set, a, a piece of tissue in the motor cortex, it no longer is able to do its job, right? So that muscle won't fire in response to that signal. If you put a new neuron back in that same place, just putting it there won't do you any good because it doesn't have a connection to the right place, right? Because that connection doesn't just automatically reform. So if you can just take the tissue out and then put new tissue back in and graft it back into place and it works, what that means is it can't be working by projecting to some distant part of the brain because those distant connections don't reform. Rather, it has to be secreting a chemical outside of the synapse that has a broader effect without needing to project to a specific location. So whatever is happening in the SCN, it's it probably at least in part a neurosecretory component, meaning a secretion of a neural chemical um, like a, or an endocrine or a neuromodulator uh, kind of chemical. And here's a graphic of this process. So uh, the SCN, again, is synchronized by the biological, by the time of day, by light, and it's a biological clock. Um, and it goes through a process um, uh, triggering other nuclei. Um, those nuclei have two effects. One is on the orexin, and then the other effect is on the, um, the, uh, the slow wave on sleep-promoting region. So the orexin keeps you awake. The inhibitory effect on the sleep-promoting region in the preoptic area also keeps you awake. So both of those things function to keep you awake during the day as a result of the SCN, um, making uh, this neuro presumably primarily a neurosecretory kind of function. So that's the SCN. There's one more gland that you ought to know about if you're talking about circadian rhythms. And it's actually kind of funny because this is the one we end up spending a lot of time about, which is the pineal gland. So the pineal gland is a gland that's located in the head. It's um, kind of sandwiched in between the backs of the cerebral hemispheres uh, above the brainstem. And um, the pineal gland uh, makes melatonin. It's activated via an indirect route from the suprachiasmatic nucleus involving the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and the SEN drives a pineal gland to secrete melatonin. And the melatonin is secreted at night. Um, and so this is another thing that the suprachiasmatic nucleus drives, which is making melatonin. But um, this is, and although this process is somewhat poorly understood, it is a feedback process, meaning melatonin is monitored by the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and so melatonin then has an effect on keeping the suprachiasmatic nucleus going according to its clock pattern. The reason that we know uh, well, we, that we know this well, if you ask people about as circadian functions, they'll mention melatonin almost immediately, is because an artificial increase in melatonin in the evening, in essence, can function in the same way that light functions as a zeitgeber or a giver of time. So light, um, light in the morning tells you you're supposed to be awake. Uh, the dawn tells you that it's a new day, that you're supposed to be awake and not asleep, right? That's a time giver. It resets the SCN. But since the SCN has a feedback loop with production of melatonin via the pineal gland. And melatonin production starts in the evening at around slightly before bedtime. Boosting the initial availability of melatonin also functions as a daily reset of the, um, of the SCN. And so melatonin can be really useful in managing sleep disturbances. Uh, this is a graphic of that process. Um, so, uh, this is a, essentially a graphic of the circadian rhythm, all the way from midnight, all the way back to midnight again. And um, let's look at the evening. Um, melatonin secretion starts at 2100 hours, 
Um, that's uh, uh, nine o'clock. Okay. Yeah, nine o'clock. Melatonin secretion starts. Um, as melatonin secretion starts, it has some inhibitory effects that get you ready for sleep. Suppressing bowel movements is pretty good. You don't want to have that problem while you're sleeping, right? Um, and in fact, that's why, generally speaking, like even little kids um, will have an uresis during the night, but they don't have that capricis during the night. So it's suppressed during the sleep phase. Um, and sleep starts also, right? And you're sleeping, you have deep sleep, your body temperature drops. In the morning, um, your blood pressure starts to rise, uh, and melatonin secretion stops. Um, usually, that means, so since melatonin secretion started and bowel movement stopped, Melatonin secretion stopping triggers a bowel movement. That's why lots of people have to have one of these in the morning. Um, and then you become alert. Uh, as melatonin uh, secretion stops, you have the alert phase. All the things we've just been talking about, circadian-wise, uh, keep you awake. Um, you're at your best during the daytime hours. Uh, and then eventually, in the evening, that process begins again. Um, your blood pressure peaks. Your body temperature peaks. And then the process starts again, and then the next night your blood pressure lowers, your body temperature lowers. Uh, and that's the circadian rhythm. <coughs> Essentially what you do with melatonin to improve your sleep uh, is supplement here about half an hour before sleep onset. So if you want to go to bed at 10 p.m., you would take melatonin at about 9.30. This initial melatonin burst is boosted, um, and what happens is you start making melatonin a little bit earlier. I'm sorry, so you start making... Your, study, your body starts to have melatonin available a little earlier. Um, the cycle, we talked about that hourglass, works its way during, on the normal time scale, which means that you also stop making melatonin a little bit earlier. The cycle works its way in its normal time scale, which means that you start making melatonin earlier again the next night. And this whole clock gets shifted back. And um, the benefit of that, uh, in general, is um, an improvement in sleep onset time, um, and uh, in some cases also an improvement in uh, total sleep. Uh, a good outcome in children is uh, um, an improvement, what I say clinically with this is usually, uh, you take melatonin every night, half an hour before our sleep, I consider a good outcome to be an improvement of about an hour uh, in sleep, on, an hour to an hour and a half in sleep onset time, and. Uh, an hour and a half to two hours of total sleep. Uh, it's really useful in particular in uh, some situations like autism. Some kids with autism sleep a lot less than they're supposed to. So you have little kids who are supposed to be sleeping 11 or 12 hours a night, getting three or four hours of sleep a night in some extreme cases. So, and then in less extreme cases, you might have a kid who's supposed to get nine hours of sleep getting seven. So if this works, you know, you might get boosted right back to eight and a half, nine hours, like right where you need to be. Yeah. Any questions about that? Um, so, it works best in adults in a condition called delayed sleep phase syndrome, where essentially, that makes sense, this whole clock has been shifted forward. Uh, this happens a lot in, um, in younger people, actually, um, where they, they're wound up at night and not sleepy during, uh, during the evening, um, as opposed to advanced sleep phase syndrome, which is more common in older adults, where you start wanting to go to bed at 7 p.m. instead of 10. Um, so delayed sleep phase syndrome patients um, actually do particularly well on melatonin. Um, and basically that works by this exogenous melatonin, melatonin from outside the body, accelerates internal melatonin produ production. Um, and so it's, it's helpful for this kind of situation. So the most helpful case for melatonin is for the person who's wound up at night and groggy in the morning, meaning they want to go to bed too late and they want to wake up too late, that person is likely to have uh, an advancing of sleep phase, causing them to go to bed an hour, hour and a half earlier, uh, and, and that can get them back to normal. Um, phototherapy is also useful for affecting sleep phase. This makes sense. We talked about light being the zeitgeiber. And so, um, for instance, if you have uh, advanced sleep phase, meaning you're falling asleep too early and waking up too early, you can add light in the evening. Adding light in the evening will um, tell your brain that you're not ready to sleep yet because it's not night yet.
and it will push the sleep phase back. Um, it's a little bit less clear whether um, uh, phototherapy has a long-term benefit. Phototherapy has some other complex benefits, particularly people who have seasonal affective disorder. It can be useful in basically compensating for the abnormality of the circadian rhythm during uh, the winter months uh, in northern climates like this one. Uh, it becomes more and more of an issue as you go further north, and so it's a bigger issue, say, in northern Russia um, or, or Canada than it is in Michigan. So that's the end of the sleep lecture. Um, just to hit on some high points, um, sleep is a behavior, uh, and it can be understood as one. It has specific observables in terms of the gross behavior, but also neurocognitive observables like EEG changes. Um, and it comes in these different sleep phases, um, four phases of sleep plus REM. Um, we talked about insomnia, and so there's primary and secondary insomnia. Primary insomnia is when it's just the sleep problem by itself. Insomnia can be caused by a variety of issues, but once it gets created, it can take on a life of its own. Um, and there are a number of other sleep disturbances. Um, we just talked about uh, delayed and advanced sleep phase, but also narcolepsy, sleep apnea, um, REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, and uh, as we understand these, these uh, I mentioned earlier that orexin was responsive, was in, important in understanding narcolepsy. Now from today's lecture, you start to see why that's the case. Uh, so today we talked about how sleep is important both for resting the brain uh, during slow wave sleep and for uh, consolidating uh, learning, um, particularly during REM sleep for non-declarative memory, but also during slow wave sleep for declarative memories. Um, and then finally, we talked about the chemical and neuronal control. The chemical control, in particular, via adenosine, which keeps you asleep, and um, orexin, uh, which keeps you awake. Uh, and then neural control uh, via um, the preoptic area, which is sleep promoting, uh, and uh, are these pumps for these different chemicals which are uh, awake promoting, uh, and the SCM, which is kind of the master control function. Um, so that's sleep. Any questions? Okay. So a few more topics. Um, and all these topics will be hopefully a chance to review things we've already been talking about, uh, neurotransmitters and other uh, neurochemicals that we've already been talking about. Uh, structures and processes that we've already been talking about. You know, for instance, we talked about how the hypothalamus is very important in the, the 4F behaviors. And so here we're talking about those 4Fs, right? We're talking about um, uh, self-regulatory kinds of uh, upkeep kinds of behaviors of your body, and so reproduction falls in that category. Uh, so we'll continue to talk about reproduction. Um, just, as a, just as a point of interest, I want to mention really briefly, this is kind of a bone of contention that a lot of psychologists will tell you, we understand ver relatively very little about human sexuality in a formal scientific sense. In fact, most of everything you read about human sexuality uh, in the popular science press, a lot of it is, not, is nonsense. Um, because we don't do that kind of research, because it's politically sensitive. Uh, and Naomi Wolf was in the news, uh, uh, if you're familiar with her, was it uh, a few days ago on the 26th, making this point in USA Today. Uh, in particular, with respect to women's sexuality, uh, it's very poorly understood. The amount of learning that we have made uh, in human-specific sexuality since, uh, since the old stuff, like Kinsey and Masters and Johnson, uh, really not that much. <coughs> and we really spend very, very little money funding research in this area, um, you know, outside of a, a small handful of things. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of uh, money being spent on treatment of, of sexual dysfunction, um, but even that is selected for certain aspects of it. And there's lots and lots of things we don't understand about human sexuality. So you'll notice that um, as we talk about human sexuality in the book, you see, notice, when we talk about sexuality in the book, you notice an abrupt shift in almost everything in this chapter is animal model based. And that in large part is because we don't know, honestly, very much about how a lot of these things play out in humans. We think that these patterns are consistent across species, and a lot of this learning does apply to humans. Human uh, sexual behavior is obviously a lot more complicated than the sexual behavior of mice and rats, uh, but we can learn from them uh, nonetheless. Um, to start with, another thing that's very different about this topic than almost every other topic we talk about 
is the relative importance of sexual dimorphism. So we talked about how sexual dimorphism very early on, we mentioned that what that means is uh, characters uh, of growth or development that are different in men and women are males and females. Many characteristics of men and women are very, very similar, right? Many physiological characteristics are very, very similar. We all have two arms and two legs. We all have 10 fingers and 10 toes for the most part. We have two eyes, two nostrils. Uh, we have the same four brain lobes. We have uh, the same spinal organization. We have the same internal viscera for the most part. We all have hearts and lungs and kidneys and livers. Most aspects of human development are not sex specific. But the few things that are sex specific are almost all related in some way to reproduction uh, behaviors, including parenting. Uh, so sexually dimorphic body features are particularly important in interpreting attractiveness. Uh, so for instance, um, uh, as an example of body features that are sexually dimorphic, uh, foot size is a common one. Women have smaller feet than men. Uh, feet are often considered a point of physical attraction in women. Uh, hair uh, is different in men and women. Uh, facial shape is different in men and women. Uh, physical size. Uh, so men tend to be viewed as attractive at larger sizes compared to the average, and women tend to be viewed as attractive at smaller sizes than the average. Because again, that is exaggerating the sexually dimorphic difference between the average man and the average woman. Um, so that's the body. And then we're, today we're also going to be talking about the few parts of the brain that are very different between men and women. And they're obviously relevant, because if you ask yourself, are men and women exactly the same? We all pretty much agree that we're not, right? But what I do want you to remember in context is that many, many things are very similar between sexes. Uh, and we'll understand the specifics of some things that are not so different. Uh, I do want to mention really briefly, I'll use the term sex consistently. Uh, so generally speaking, um, in biology, and I offer you an analogy, essentially sex is like the genotype and gender is like the phenotype. Meaning sex is the biological characteristic. Like do you have two X chromosomes or do you have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome? Gender is the expression of that. Most people who have two X chromosomes have a, a feminine gender. Most people who have XY have a masculine gender. But we're going to focus on the biological sex. Um, and we'll talk about situations where these are incongruent with me as well. Uh, and those are potentially interesting in understanding uh, uh, sexual functioning. So we're going to be talking about genetics in this lecture. And I'm going to give you a refresher. It's a good time to go back to some things we talked about before. So, the karyotype is the overall gross structure of the genome, right? The, the body of the genome. And it consists of 23 pairs of chromosomes. So there are 46 chromosomes all together in the normal human uh, karyotype. Uh, and 23 of, 22 pairs are, are all, of, all of them except two, are, um, are just regular chromosomes. And they come in pairs. And the two chromosomes look similar. They have a similar structure. And then there's a sex chromosome pair where uh, in females, it's two X's, and in males, it's an X and a Y. Um, so, <coughs> gametes arise from meiotic division, a special meiotic division process. So, remember going way back to high school biology, there's mitosis and meiosis. Uh, in mitosis, you end up with two duplicate cells that are the same, same compositionally as the original cell. In meiotic division, you end up with two cells that each have parts of the original cell. So this is a special meiotic division in which each gamete ends up with one of each pair of chromosomes, including one sex chromosome. And the, they're replicated without the other from the pair in the gamete. And so gametes are special cells. They don't have 46 chromosomes. They only have 23. Um, and the sperm carries either an X or a Y chromosome because there is one X and one Y chromosome in the male karyotype. And so that uh, X or Y from the sperm determines the sex of the offspring. Okay. This should be familiar, hopefully. Uh, so when the ovum and sperm recombine, the newly constituted karyotype, the 23 from the sperm, the 23 from the ova, has 46 chromosomes again, including two sex chromosomes. There are karyotype abnormalities, as you probably are aware, that are specific to, um, uh, to um, reproductive functions, and there are some that are not specific to reproductive functions. Uh, so for instance, uh, trisomy um, 
23 uh, Down syndrome is one that's non-specific, right, uh, to sex, and so there there's an extra chromosome that's not a sex chromosome, and then the ones that are specific to to reproduction are things like um, uh, syndromes where a person has uh, less than two or more than two uh, sex chromosomes. So. Sexual development is driven by chromosomes, but then it's controlled hormonally. Um, and this is a general theme that we continued from the sleep lecture and we'll continue in the eating lecture. And so the body is designed in such a way that the chromosomes can code for all the structures necessary for either male or female presentation. But the sex chromosomes determine fetal sexualization by triggering hormonal production at developmental and critical times, uh, if, for instance, via the strygene. And this is called an organizational effect. So at this critical time, the presence of hormones, which are triggered by the sex chromosomes, results in uh, uh, branching into either a male or female sex. Um, it only happens at that critical time. It changes the organization of the body and the brain, uh, including the brain. So there are also activational effects of hormones. Activational effects happen later uh, throughout the lifespan, but particularly in puberty and in adult life. Um, what's important about these to note is that hormonally, later, after the fact, you cannot compensate for an early organizational effect, right? Like if fetal masculinization or, or, or perinatal masculinization doesn't occur, putting hormones in the system later won't recreate those effects because those brain structures are already set. In contrast, the activational effects can happen in a later time. Uh, and this has to do with, for instance, why uh, the hormone therapies used in, in sex reassignment surgeries are only partially effective, because they affect activation but not organization. The internal sex organs, um, the early ones are hermaphroditic, and again, the chromosome can code for the entire male or female presentation. The chromosome of all people. So uh, everyone has an X chromosome. Um, we all have the ability to code for the female presentation. We all also, even without a Y chromosome, we all have the ability to code for the male presentation as well. But it doesn't get activated, um, and so it doesn't develop during the organizational phase. I'm sorry. So it doesn't get triggered, so it doesn't develop during the organizational phase. I should be careful about the wording. Because I don't mean this kind of activation. I mean that the hormone presence at that developmentally critical time causes an effect. So these early organs are hermaphroditic, meaning they're not sexually dimorphic. But the hormonally driven activation process causes development of the Mullerian and Wolfian or Wolfian systems. And these systems are precursor to the well-developed um, female and male uh, internal sex organs. Um, so, and then, so then finally, the third <coughs> component of the sex organs are their gonads. These are uh, the ovary or testes, and these make hormones and also make gametes. They're the internal sex organs, uh, and then they're the external genitalia. Uh, and these are all developing in conjunction, driven by this hormonally triggered uh, developmental organizational process. So, graphically, this is the early precursor uh, reproductive system. What's important to know about the reproductive system in this precursor phase is that it's both male and female. So it has hardware that can develop into the female uh, reproductive system. It has hardware that can also develop into the male reproductive system. The single pair of gonads will either become ovaries or testes, uh, and so forth. So, um, the differentiation, the, the organizational process leads from this undifferentiated uh, hermaphroditic, bisexual, whatever uh, structure that can be male or female, and that diverges into these two different processes. What's important to know about this is that there are a lot of analogs, right? Like if you look at the system just graphically in these schematics, you see there are pieces that look very similar. Like structures that communicate between the internal sex organs and the gonads. They're present in the male, they're present in the female. Um, and when you look at the external genitalia, the same pattern emerges. 
there, all these structures um, have common precursors. Um, so I don't think I have a picture of that. Uh, but um, for instance, uh, some examples of that would be, um, let's see, um, some examples of that would be that the skin that, uh, that forms the testicular sac uh, become the labia uh, in the female. Uh, so that's the same tissue, but there's a common precursor that leads to the two different things. Uh, the ovaries and testes are obviously the same. Uh, there are other things. Um, uh, so, you know, for, for instance, most of the nerves uh, are concentrated in the clitoris and in the uh, glands of the penis. And so those are common structures. The structures come from the same common precursor. It's an organizational principle. So, how does that common precursor become these two different things? And obviously the fact that these two things are different is crucial, the important, it's not a trivial factor, because otherwise there wouldn't be a reproductive process, otherwise uh, there wouldn't be offspring. So this is obviously quite important, uh, and the system is well designed to do this. So how does it become masculine or feminine? So um, there's a two-factor hormonal process uh, that leads to masculinization. And the dominant viewpoint of this process is, generally speaking, that the internal bias is to develop a female system, and active processes deviate from the female system to the male system, although there are also active feminization processes. Um, so there are two processes that cause masculinization. One is anti-malarian, so it prevents feminized, feminization development. So again, there's an active feminization process. That process is inhibited in males. And then the second active process is an androgen process that causes masculinization. So you have to both inhibit feminization and cause masculinization. Um, they, they're, not, they're not opposite ends of a spectrum, but rather uh, it's more like a two by two graph. You can have the presence or absence of both independently. So androgens stimulate the development of the Wolfian system, which is the precursor to the male uh, sex organs. And those androgens are testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. And DHT is enzymatically produced from testosterone, so they're chemically related. Um, the initial sexual system, the pre-differentiated one, contains <coughs> anti-malarian receptors only. So the initial system can either become feminine or it can, that feminization can be prevented. But the Wolfian receptors that cause masculinization don't show up until the Wolfian system. Um, and so the masculinization, the second piece, can't happen until the Wolfian system is already uh, developed. So we talked a few times now about the idea of a double dissociation, two disorders that have contrary patterns. Here's another good example of that. So there are two syndromes, rare, but they exist, androgen insensitivity and persistent malaria duct syndrome. So this syndrome means that you start with a male phenotype, uh, but development mirrors the female body, and the reason for that is that the uh, malarian system is inhibited, but the Wolfian system is not um, is uh, is not triggered. Um, and in contrast, in persistent malarian syndrome, the malarian system is not inhibited, but the Wolfian system is triggered, uh, and so. What happens here is, in the first case, you, um, you don't get the masculine body development. And by default, even though this is inhibited, you still end up with a female-like body development, although it won't be a truly female body. In the second case, what happens is that you create male sex organs, but you fail to inhibit the creation of female sex organs. And so you end up with both. Uh, and then typically, so this phenotype, this genotype, sorry, this phenotype looks more male, but these internal female sex organs interfere with the functioning of the internal male sex organs. But it's a double dissociation because one has to do with a failure to inhibit the malarian system, the other one has to do with a failure to activate the Wolfian system. These are both disorders in males uh, because they have to do with these two phases of uh, masculinization, uh, the one that inhibits the malaria and the one that triggers the Wolfian. Okay, so 
Uh, another, a uh, few more examples of interesting syndromes that tell us some things about reproductive development. <coughs> so Turner syndrome is a monosomy of the sex chromosomes. There's just one sex chromosome. There's an X with no Y. So what this does is there's a failure to create testes and a failure to develop masculinization uh, because there's no Y chromosome. But there's also no, there are also no ovaries because ovaries don't form until you have two X chromosomes. So development closely mirrors internal and external female development without gonads. Uh, and the system is a non-functional system. Um, however, since there are no gonads, the activational component doesn't happen. So because they go, the ovaries are not producing uh, estrogen, uh, at puberty, there's no sexual maturation unless there's hormone replacement therapy. Uh, and so what this tells you is that uh, here, in this example, uh, is a partial development and feminization. Uh, the organizational part happens for the most part, but not completely. But then the activational component is inhibited. Here, with activation, you will get quasi-normal sexual maturation. There will never be ovaries, and so the reproductive system won't be functional for cutting off spring, but you can normalize a lot of this because, again, you can normalize activational effects, but you can't normalize organizational effects unless you intervene before the organization occurs, which is hard to do because this is happening really early. So uh, here are the external genitalia. Um, what I want to really just emphasize here is that there are two different processes that form the male and female external genitalia, but I want to emphasize that the underpinnings are common, and so this undifferentiated stage differentiates it to the male and the female, um, the male and the female, sorry, um, and each component of the male and female reproductive external genitalia um, is mirrored, and there's essentially a, a counterpart uh, in the other sex. Um, and Characteristics of them are similar. For instance, um, the glands and the clitoris are similar. Uh, they both have high um, uh, uh, receptor density. Um, so they're very sensitive. Um, OK. So that's the hormonal control of reproductive development. Just like in sleep and eating, we're going to talk also about neurological control, neural control of sexual maturation. So there are hormonal and neural components. This is the neural component. The neural component, uh, unsurprisingly, involves the hypothalamus, right? You should uh, expect that by now. And the hypothalamus secretes, uh, we're talking about how the hypothalamus, part of what it does is it is a master control system for the entire glandular system, all the hormonal processes. So the hypothalamus secretes gonadotropin-releasing hormones. Um, and what gonadotropin-releasing hormones do is stimulate the anterior pituitary gland to release gonadotropin hormones. So gonadotropic means, um, trophic means uh, encouraging or developing and, and gonads. And so gonadotropic hormones foster development of gonads um, or in the gonads. And so there are two kinds of gonadotropic hormones, FSH and LH, uh, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone it's easiest to understand what these two do based on what they do in females, uh, but they do both act in males as well. Um, and they act differently in males and females. Uh, in females, they stimulate the production of follicle, which basically means the maturing of an ova um, uh, to prepare it for release and uh, insemination. Uh, and then luteinization, which uh, uh, which triggers the use of that mature ova. And um, the gonadotropic process also really results in secretion of estradiol, which is a, a female sex hormone. In males, uh, conceptually similar, stimulate the production of sperm. What's different is that sperm are created continuously over the course of life, whereas uh, ova are created initially uh, and then matured over time. So the ova are created when the, the undifferentiated gonad becomes an ovary, essentially, whereas the sperm are continuously created. But in both cases, you have stimulation of, uh, of 
um, uh, release and preparation of the gamete, and then you have release of uh, um, uh, sex hormone, uh, so estradiol in the case of females and testosterone in the case of males. So the estrogens and the androgens produce female and male sex characteristics. Um, and here we're talking about, um, so uh, we're talking about primary sex characteristics. Um, and they're produced primarily by the uh, ovary and the testes. However, the adrenal glands of both sexes also produce testosterone. This is an important point. So testosterone is active uh, in both males and females, although there's much stronger sensitivity to it in males than females. So one thing that testosterone does in both sexes is growth of these secondary sex characteristics, like axillary and pubic hair. Um, men are more sensitive to testosterone than women, and so they have more uh, body hair than women do. Uh, but the growth of body hair in both sexes is due to testosterone. Um, OK, so uh, hormonal control of sexual behavior. Uh, in female primates, reproductive behavior is somewhat controlled hormonally. So here we're talking about now behavior and not development. So here we're talking about um, hormonal development and neural development. Now hormonal control of sexual behavior. Um, reproductive behaviors are also somewhat controlled hormonally uh, by the ovaries, by the pituitary gland. Um, in particular, the, the estrel or menstrual cycle is controlled um, Hormonally, um, and so you know, for instance, ova are present at birth, but FSH causes the development of a follicle around an ovum, which prepares it for conception. Uh, it causes estradiol to be secreted, which causes the uterine lining to grow to prepare it for implantation of the ova. Um, and the pituitary gland monitors estradiol level and triggers luteinizing hormone, which causes ovulation when uh, the system is ready for ovulation. Um, the corpus luteum produces more estradiol and also progesterone, which can allow for gestation and inhibit another follicle from being produced um, so that the menstrual cycle doesn't continue during pregnancy. And then finally, when if the ova is not fertilized, then ultimately the ova exits the system, it stops producing progesterone, and that ends this process. So it's a feedback loop. Um, the uh, um, the FSH, which comes ultimately from a hypothalamic process, causes follicleization of an ova. Then the estradiol causes the uterine lining to grow. The luteinizing hormone causes the deposition of the ova. And that keeps the process going. But if the ova is not fertilized, then ultimately the progesterone stops being available and the process termi uh, terminates and it starts over again. So here's a graphic of that. Um, the anterior pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. Uh, so gonadotropic hormone, gonadotropic releasing hormones result, factors really result in releasing of gonadotropic hormones. Those hormones that affect the gonad, uh, they cause uh, the follicle stimulating hormone causes a follicle to grow around an ova. Um, the luteinizing hormone causes that ova to break free. Um, and then uh, that produces estradiol um, and uh, progesterone, which can allow for um, uh, conception, uh, that implement, implantation of the post-conception post uh, 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 cell, and then uh, development of it, uh, gestation. Uh, and if that process doesn't happen, then ultimately it goes back and starts over again over here. So um, in animals, uh, basic male as well as female sexual behaviors. So that's that's a part of sexual behavior, reproductive behavior, but also the sexual behaviors actually involving the sex itself. They're fairly well documented. So people have spent time studying how um, rodents get on, right? Um, and if you look at female uh, rodents, if you analyze just the intercourse, that would indicate relatively few generic sexual behaviors. Uh, that we can understand uh, and trace back to these neurochemical controls. But um, if you look at precoital behaviors, um, behaviors that have to do with um, 
proceptivity or eagerness, eagerness to engage in sex, receptivity or ability or willingness to engage in sex, and judgment of attraction of potential mates, these are all things that happen before sex. These things are clearly um, sexual behaviors that can be analyzed and are, are clearly evident in the female rodents as well as the male rodents. Uh, and so the, the broader pre-coital and coital behaviors of the rodents can actually be fairly well understood in both the males and the females. Uh, and so the book talks about a number of examples of that in, in their own kind of way. Uh, rodents do engage in approximations of the more complex pre-sex behaviors that humans engage in, uh, but they're obviously adapted to rodents as opposed to humans. Um, hormonally, again, with sexual behaviors, there's a discrete process that involves defeminization or elimination of feminine sexual behaviors and a discrete process that involves masculinization of sexual behaviors. Uh, and again, you can see a double dissociation in the right kinds of contexts where each one of these is individually controllable by different kinds of um, modifications to the, the genome, for instance. So, um, so that's control of sexual behavior. Um, there are some additional hormonal processes that are important to or some chemical processes that are important to understand that are fairly unique to sexual behaviors. And pheromones definitely fall into that category. So definitionally, what a pheromone is, is it's an interbody communication chemical as opposed to an intra-body communication chemical. And so what that means is hormones are used to communicate from one part of the body to another. Pheromones are used to communicate from one, one organism to another organism in the same um, uh, species. So hormone, pheromones are detected by the olfactory system as well as a secondary system called the vomeronasal system. And the difference between the two is that vomeronasal system is more sensitive to non-volatile compounds that are carried in liquids. Uh, and so these are particularly chemicals that are carried in, in urine and vaginal secretions. Uh, and so these are chemicals that are stored in liquids uh, that are detected vomeronasally as opposed to airborne chemicals that are detected uh, by the olfactory system. And there are a number of documented pheromonal effects in animals. Uh, the Lee Boot effect is a slowing or stopping of the estrous cycle in females that are housed without a male. The Witten uh, effect is a restarting and synchronization of uh, estrous cycles in response to the presence of a male mouse. Uh, the Vandenberg effect, stimulation of early puberty in female rodents in response to a sexually immature male. Um, the Bruce effect, inhibition or termination of pregnancy in response to a novel male mouse. Um, so this one might be a little bit counterintuitive, but the idea here would be that um, uh, for a female mouse, uh, the functional goal is to create offspring and have those offspring survive. Uh, and so suppose that the female mouse uh, is in an environment where there are one or more, more male mice. Um, the male mice have a functional goal, which is to create offspring and have those offspring survive as well. But if a female mouse is impregnated by one mouse, and then that mouse, say, is killed or leaves, and a different male mouse is around, that new male mouse is no longer, um, no longer has a functional benefit in, in the survival of the, my, the, the infants from the previous male mouse. And, neither do, and the female obviously does have a benefit in providing in the survival of that previous pregnancy. But in the long term, the female might have more um, success in passing on its gene code by mating with the male mouse several times than by survival of the existing pregnancy from the previous mouse. And that's essentially the, the logic behind the Bruce effect. Um, in the long term, this would lead to more successful surviving offspring. The female mouse is not being mean hearted in that example. It's just a process that's self-consistent, right? If the female mouse were to prefer the initial pregnancy over the future pregnancies, that would lead to a smaller number of offspring, right? And so numerically, there are more of these offspring from the newer pregnancy than the older pregnancy, so the system is biased to prefer the newer pregnancy over the older one. Um, there are, these are all um, pheromonal effects that, are, that occur in the female in response to pheromones uh, secreted by the male. 
There are also pheromonal effects that are driven by female secreted pheromones that are excreted by the female and detected by the male. Uh, and these things actually do have potential analogs in human sexual behavior. Um, in particular, there are definitely um, situ environmental situations that can stimulate uh, precocious, precocious sexuality in female uh, humans as well. It may not work exactly like a male, uh, female rodents, but that concept does exist in, in humans as well. And it's possible that some of these others do as well. So the vomeral nasal system. Uh, the vomeronasal nasal system is, uh, starts with uh, this vomeronasal nasal organ. This organ uh, is part of the nose structure. Uh, it's a separate organ from the rest of the olfactory system. It has a separate input nerve that goes to uh, the accessory olfactory bulb in mice. Uh, this main olfactory bulb here, this is receiving innervation from the olfactory system. This is receiving innervation from the vomero nasal system and then projecting into the brain. Um, so that's hormones and closely related pheromones. What about neural controls of reproductive behaviors? So it should be pretty obvious that reproductive behaviors, some of them, happen very quickly, right? too quickly to be purely hormonally controlled. And because hormones just, they take time. They're not something, hormones don't explain anything that happens in milliseconds or um, you know a short uh, period of time like that. That has to be neurologically controlled. So uh, as expected, the hypothalamus is involved uh, in related structures. And I want to give you some examples of that. Uh, in males, uh, the medial preoptic area, which is part of the hypothalamus, or associated with a hypothalamus, has a nucleus. This nucleus is called a sexually dimorphic nucleus because it's bigger in males than females. Uh, and it's stimulated by androgen uh, in its developmental phase. And its effect is also maintained by androgen after development. And so it, there is both an organizational and an activational effect of androgen, uh, androgens on the, uh, the medial preoptic area of sexually dimorphic nucleus, or SDN. So, in rodents, the SDN receives the vomeronasal input, so this is where it goes. And that, so the vomeronasal input, which detects pheromones, is going to a nucleus in the brain that has a sexually dimorphic characteristic. And the SDN controls motor innervation of the pelvic organs, uh, meaning it controls the, the sexual response via the periaqueduct of gray matter and also the medulla. Um, and the system works by normal inhibition of spinal motor neurons uh, via serotonin. And so serotonin interacts with the system uh, inhibiting these spinal motor neurons uh, normally. Uh, and then that's overridden by input from the sexually dimorphic nucleus. And the book mentions briefly that sexual side effects are common with certain SSRIs. This is the reasoning for it. SSRIs make serotonin more available. When serotonin is more available, it has a stronger inhibitory effect on these spinal motor neurons that are um, triggering sexual functions. And so those sexual functions don't get triggered even when the SDN is, uh, it, when the hypothalamus is innervating uh, the PAG to, uh, to, to reduce this inhibition. So here is that picture in males. Um, and uh, this is the mouse brain remember, um, so uh, it looks a little bit different from the human brain, uh, but the medial preoptic area is hypothalamic related. Um, it is stimulating uh, the nucleus perigigantocellularis and the medulla and the periaqueductal gray matter, uh, which also stimulates the, the, the perigigantocellularis nucleus. Uh, that leads to main behavior by overriding serotonergic inhibition of uh, spinal motor neurons. Um, meanwhile, other structures pay, play an interactive role in this. The amygdala, in particular, is important. Um, and, and that kind of makes sense. Emotions are obviously very important in determining 
the appropriateness of sexual behaviors. Um, so just in terms of what some of these structures will do, uh, the MPA, which acts on these to act on the spine to overcome the serotonergic uh, inhibition. So if you get rid of the MPA, it's going to abolish sexual behavior. <coughs> um, and prenatal stress actually will reduce the size of the SDN, and that will decrease sexual behavior. Um, and that may be potentially sensible. Uh, in even postnatal stress, this may be potentially sensible. Um, generally speaking, uh, animals are biased against sexual behavior in, in high-stress environments. Uh, and then they return to it in low-stress environments. That's very consistent with sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation, for instance. We talked about how these rest and restoration kinds of activities are parasympathetic, and the sympathetic system works to inhibit those things in order for fight and flight to work. So sex is also in that category of activities that you're not going to want to do during an emergency, right? And so it makes some sense that stress would inhibit um, sexual functioning. Um, this structure is, has an activational effect as well as an organizational effect. And so for instance, that is consistent with the fact that injecting testosterone here will increase sexual behavior in rats that don't have a testicular production of testosterone. That's consistent with the activational effect, because if it was a pure organizational effect, you wouldn't expect the testosterone to do anything useful uh, when put here. Uh, so that's the MPA. Um, the periaqueductal gray matter is, um, is normally excitative of the P and PGI, which normally inhibits mating behavior. So inhibiting it with the MPI by the medial preoptic area inhibits the inhibition and or inhibits the excitation of the nucleus paragigantocellularis. When you uh, reduce the uh, when you reduce this inhibition, you increase this excitation. When you increase this excitation, um, you reduce this inhibition of mating behaviors and um, and then ultimately you trigger the main behaviors. So interacting with all of this are things like sensory inputs other than the bone nasal system, like tactile information, uh, learn, learning uh, and memory, um, and uh, things like the tegmental field as well. So that's in males, uh, and a real core player are hypothalamic-related structures as well as the um, midbrain and brainstem. Uh, in females, uh, similar structures are involved. The ventromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus is a necessary pathway for sexual behaviors. So lesions here disrupt sexual behaviors, and these lesions um, cannot be remediated by hormonal administration. Um, so. Um, What that means is that it's either uh, an organizational effect and or um, the hormones are being distributed non-locally, but probably more likely it's an it's a organizational effect as opposed to an activational effect. So we talked again about how activational effects can be overcome, or organizational ones cannot. The preoptic area is also involved with similar connections, and so it's also receiving nasal input, uh, and a similar pathway the ventromedial hypothalamus and periaqueductal gray matter in the medulla, the nucleus perigigantocellularis, again, is controlling spinal motor neurons. So here is that same picture now in females. Um, so there is olfactory vomero nasal input. The ventromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus, destruction of the anabolic the sexual behavior, um, and neurons receive estrogen and progesterone. Um, you can enhance sexual behavior. So there is an activational component. Um, that, so this activational component, if there's a lack of hormone elsewhere, then putting it back in the system can overcome that. Um, but it also has, there are organizational components that can't be replicated uh, by hormone administration. Um, again, it triggers the PAG. Um, and that triggers the PGI and PGI, and again, 
that leads to spinal gating behavior. So very similar conceptually. So that's neural control of reproductive behaviors. The hypothalamus, the periaptic functional gray matter, the nucleus parogigantocellularis of the medulla uh, are particularly important structures in neural control. Uh, there's interaction between the hormonal pheromonal systems and the neural systems, right? So gomeronasal nasal input is pheromonal. Uh, there are androgen and estrogen receptors in the hypothalamus. Uh, you see here. Uh, uh, testosterone will enhance behavior uh, in the mediocryoptic area. Uh, estradiol will enhance uh, behaviors in the ventral medial hypothalamus. Um, so I want to talk about a few other aspects of sexual behavior or reproductive behavior, uh, pair bonding in particular, and, and, uh, and uh, interparent bonding. So mammals have varying degrees of pair bonding behaviors. And so that means selective mating. Um, there are some mam mammals that are highly polygamous, or uh, mammals that uh, will mate with uh, many other mates. And there are animals that are very monogamous. Um, humans are on the mon monogamous end, although there are some animals that are significantly more monogamous <coughs> than they are. Uh, meaning that in general, humans are closer to the end of selecting mates that uh, last for a long time. Um, Although we don't obviously always do that. Um, so um, we're probably going to be more similar in understanding this biological underpinning to these other monogamous animals than to the highly polygamous ones. But variation of structures between highly polygamous and highly monogamous uh, animals may also explain variability within a species. Uh, that's a working hypothesis. It could be the variability in the species is for a completely different reason. Uh, although there's some supporting evidence for that idea. So, the hormones previously described in the autism discussion are important ones. So oxytocin and vasopressin. So, we talked about oxytocin as being kind of a cuddling hormone, it increases bonding behaviors, right? So, in voles, uh, in the males, the vasopressin receptor density seems to prejudice towards monogamy, and the oxytocin seems to have a stronger contribution for the female voles. Uh, but both of these are important in uh, pair bonding. Um, and in voles, interestingly, you can find voles that um, are uh, highly monogamous and voles that are less monogamous. And you find that these, uh, these vasopressin oxytocin levels uh, seem to explain that difference in males and females respectively. There's some limited evidence uh, supporting this in humans as well. Um, so you can't, uh, you can't dissect human brains very easily uh, uh, to learn about this. You can't experimentally alter a lot of these chemicals inside the brain. Uh, you can, however, administer things like oxytocin intranasally. And there's some interest in oxytocin as a potential target of action in autism to increase social behaviors. One example that has been fairly well proven is that in humans, the administration of oxytocin will improve memory for faces, but not memory for inanimate objects. So it's the social component of the faces that uh, causes the memory to be improved. Uh, and that makes sense. Like, so if you're interested in developing relationships, whether they're sexual relationships or not, you'll be interested in being able to tell people apart, right? Because these relationships are preferential. That's their nature. You're friends with some people and not friends with other people. One person is your girlfriend or your boyfriend, the rest of them are not. So you need to be able to tell them apart. So it makes some conceptual sense that something like memory for faces would be improved by the same chemical that seems to bias towards uh, these relationship forming behaviors. Um, so that's pair bonding, and pair bonding means bonding with a mate. There's also bonding with an offspring, uh, or vice versa. And from a psychological standpoint, we do define that in a broad sense to fall within reproductive behaviors, because these are behaviors that serve to create and develop offspring. You have to be careful with that, of course, because the functional, the sociobiological Darwinian kind of explanation would argue that they're all, um, all functional behaviors are uh, oriented in some indirect or direct way at creating and developing offspring. But these ones have a more strong link to offspring 
Um, so in that sense, giving birth and parenting can be considered reproductive behaviors. Um, and maternal and paternal behavior, both kinds of parental behavior, have a hormonal control. One thing that's important to know about hormonal control of parenting behaviors is it's activational and not organizational. You've heard people probably say that, um, that people aren't born with uh, 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 a manual built into their heads about how to be a parent, right? So this is actually supportive of that argument. Uh, I mentioned Naomi Wolf at the beginning of the article. She mentions in, in one of her memoirs, actually, that she was one of those people uh, who gave birth to a child and had no idea how to be a parent whatsoever. It didn't come naturally to her. Um, it's not organizational, meaning that most of these parenting behaviors seem to be triggered at the time of having a child present, rather than something that develops over time that gets you ready to be a parent. Um, that's good in a lot of ways, because you can fix this much easy, more easily than you can fix this. So in principle, you know, in the future, you can imagine people who have trouble developing a, a parental bond could potentially take a medication that would prime them to be able to form a, a bond with their child. However, I should say that it is a sensitizing process. Um, so what that means is that, so you can take a, a rodent that has never had sex, that hasn't been pregnant, and you can cause that rodent to develop a parental bond to an unrelated infant by co-locating them. However, once that, that bond is, is activated hormonally, it's not organized hormonally, meaning it's not something about the pre-existing brain of the rat, the adult rat. However, once the bond is formed, it does persist, meaning that that rat later, if placed around several um, pups, will selectively care for the one that they bonded with as an infant, even though it's not theirs. Uh, and you, know, you see that in, in humans, too. Humans can adopt and bond with the child they adopt. It's important to understand also that this process is affected hormonally, but not controlled hormonally. So you probably can't just administer hormones to a parent and make them super mom or super dad. Um, there are going to be lots of variations in parenting behaviors that are not uh, affected purely or explained purely by hormonal control. That also conceptually makes sense because lots of maternal and parent maternal behaviors, these parental behaviors again are quick behaviors. Your child does something, you respond to it. So quick behaviors are going to be bad candidates for pure hormonal control, right? They need neurological control as well. So um, here are some pieces of information about parenting behaviors and hormonal control, though. So with those caveats, um, in females, in rodents, it seems to be a time sequence of progesterone, estradiol, and prolactin that um, uh, that sequence seems to sensitize for maternal behaviors. And you can, if you simulate the sequence, and the sequence has high early prolactin that falls off and comes back at the end, it has estradiol that increases over time, and then it has progesterone that peaks, maintains, and then dissipates. If you replicate this pattern of hormonal presence in a rodent, uh, in a rodent that hasn't given birth, you will bias them towards uh, bonding with the infant. Um, however, uh, in addition to these three, oxytocin does seem to be involved in parental bonding as well as um, mate bonding or pair bonding. So progesterone and estradiol, these are sex hormones. Prolactin, um, as you might guess from the name, uh, it stimulates lactation, but it also does a number of other things. Um, so prolactin is another hormone that's, that's kind of co-involved with a lot of processes with vasopressin and, um, and oxytocin. And there are reciprocal relationships that we're not going to get into in this class between hormones. And so hormones can control hormones, much like the uh, anterior pituitary gland can cause other glands to, uh, to uh, express hormones. So that's the hormonal control. Like we said, there's probably going to be a neural control of, of parent parenting behavior, too. And in females, it appears to be the medial preoptic area. This was the region that was important in male sexual behavior seems to be important in the female maternal behavior. Um, 
And this region becomes more active after sensitization to a pod. Uh, and it appears to act by projection to the midbrain and then subsequently to the brain stem reticular formation. So the brain stem reticular formation is, a, is an arousal uh, activation kind of region of the brain stem. Remember, there were two reticular formations, one in the brain stem. There's also one in the thalamus. This is the one in the brain stem. Uh, so the MPA projects to these and triggers different kinds of behaviors or predispositions towards behaviors, as well as a different level of alertness. Alertness is obviously very important. For instance, if you have a, a newborn at home, you want to be able to wake up when they cry at night, uh, and so that sensitization occurs. And some of that may be sexually dimorphic. There's some evidence that uh, this process, some of this process is unique to females, and that may explain why certain things um, seem to be uh, things that females do better, like there seems to be a stronger sensitization uh, to nighttime crying by infants, uh, for instance. Um, there is less known about neural control of paternal behavior, and in general, there's a lot of emphasis, if you look at the emphases, some of this has to do with the way the research works and, and the way the animals behave, and which behaviors are more subtle and which behaviors are more prominent. It probably has to, has to do also with um, human biases in the way that we study sexuality. But um, uh, if you look at sexual sexuality research, I already mentioned that it's, it's largely lacking in humans. In animals, if you look at sexual research in males, it's almost always about having sex. If you look at sexual research in females, it's almost always about parenting. Um, and so there's relatively less emphasis on understanding parenting in, in male rodents, uh, than, but it is done. Uh, and there is some evidence of it. So, in voles, uh, again, we talked about how there are two kinds of voles. There's a monogamous vole, which is a prairie vole, and then there's a polygamous vole, which is um, the other kind of, I'm blanking on what it is, but the other kind of vole is a polygamous vole. Um, so, in voles, the MPA is less sexually dimorphic in the monogamous ones, and more in the polygamous, polygamous ones. And so, consistent with that, there's less sexually dimorphic behavior. For instance, there's more parenting by the male uh, proportionately, so parenting is more equally distributed between the male and the female. Um, whereas in the polygamous bowl, uh, the parenting is done more, more um, primarily by the female. And in the monogamous bowl, the MPA is activated when the male is exposed to a pup, and lesions inhibit paternal behavior, just like they inhibit maternal behavior. But that's really primarily true in the monogamous bowl. It's not really true in the polygamous bowl in which the male doesn't do as much parenting. So what this says is that to the extent that, likely to the extent that a species is monogamous and has a division of parenting by the male and the female, then you're likely to see less sexually dimorphic characteristics in the hypothalamus. Um, you are likely to see less sexually dimorphic behaviors in general. Um, that's in different species. So mon monogamous and polygamous voles are different species. What's important to note is that there's also in inter intraspecies variation. So for instance, in humans, um, there's a fairly substantial amount of variation. Uh, in almost all cultures, there's more direct care for infants and children provided by females than males. But there's a fairly substantial variation. Um, you know, for instance, a lot of the Scandinavian cultures tend to be relatively um, less uh, less um, uh, mother-centric in terms of parenting. And potentially, you will find, you know, arguably you will find some other aspects of behavior in those cultures that's less sexually dimorphic as well. Uh, and the potential underlying explanation would be uh, reduction in self the sexual dimorphic nature of the brain possibly organizationally in those cultures. But what's important to remember, too, is that these are things that are not purely genetically determined. And so there's variability even in the sense that people who move to, say, America will tend to operate according to American values, uh, meaning that if they move to America, for instance, from a culture that is um, more sexually dimorphic in parenting than we are, when they come to America, they'll probably will engage in more equal parenting than they did in their home culture. Uh, if they came from a culture that is less sexually dimorphic than America, they probably start acting like us and engage in more unbalanced parenting by the mother and the father. So 
that's, that is some limited stuff that we do understand about parenting behavior. It involves the mediocre optic area, the hypothalamus, the same area that was critical in understanding sexual behaviors uh, and, and, and parenting by the female. Um, the book does also talk about a couple of additional topics. Um, when it comes to uh, research into sexual orientation, that's fraught with even more peril than just research into sexuality to begin with, although there is a lot of interest in that. It's, it's an area where you have to be very careful because almost everybody is biased. Almost everybody has a strong opinion one way or the other. Uh, for instance, you know, among scientists, most uh, biological scientists will tell you that um, variations in sexual orientation do occur uh, in non-human animals, that there's probably a strong uh, genetic or epigenetic component to sexual orientation, uh, that it's probably something in some people that is developed very early in life, although there may be also people who have relatively ambiguous sexual orientations that can change later in life. That does seem to fit the data about humans. You do have some humans who will report, for instance, that they uh, knew that they were gay uh, at a very young age before they were sexual, like when they were five or six. And you'll see some who didn't know when they were 25 or 26. So it does seem to fit the data. You do seem to see some of the same things uh, in humans and animals, although it's different in humans than animals. Uh, our, our mating behaviors are much more complicated. Um, with respect to the brain itself, there are some pieces of the brain that seem to be sexually dimorphic, and there seems to be a relationship between sexually dimorphic structures and sexual orientation. Um, and generally, the pattern that that follows, uh, for instance, is one where, um, uh, excuse me, um, the, see how I can explain this, um, the sexual orientation uh, follows the structure of the brain that typically has that sexual orientation. Uh, and so what I mean by that is, there really can be in the sense, um, if you have the behaviors that are done by, um, say, in some broad sense, these are behaviors that are done by males and females. Suppose that um, uh, you have a, a distribution of behaviors by males. Uh, and so that distribution of male behavior is here somewhere. And you have a distribution of behavior by females. Um, that behavior is here somewhere. Um, and actually, probably the overlap is much greater than this. Um, so, um, what happened, what seems to happen to at least certain aspects of the brain is that in, so these are men, and men are, most men are attracted to women, but not all of them, right? So, what has, seems to happen is with sexually dimorphic features is they move in the direction of women. Um, and so what does that mean? Um, for instance, women tend to have um, slightly smaller brains and larger corpus callosum. And so men who are gay tend to have also slightly smaller brains than men who are heterosexual with larger corpus callosums. Although, on the other hand, those two are closely correlated variables. People with big corpus callosums have small brains and vice versa. Um, but that, that characteristic moves in the direction of the female presentation, essentially. Um, and uh, potentially similarly, you see the same kind of effect in the opposite direction. Um, uh, comparing heterosexual and homosexual females. Um, that being said, a lot of that is very inconclusive. Um, there do seem to be uh, influences that have to do with family, family constellation. And so the book talks about how uh, people with certain kinds of siblings, older siblings, are likely to be um, more likely to be homosexual than people who don't have those siblings. Um, this one is really tricky to explain. There is a concept called kin selection in, um, in uh, social biology or uh, Darwinian evolution. The idea of kin selection is that, um, suppose that you have um, a set of genes, right? Your identical twin would have exactly the same genes, right? Your sibling, your, your fraternal twin, will have some genes that are the same as yours, as yours, about half of them, but then another half that are different from yours, right? And if you go into the extended family, people who are even less closely related to you will share some component of your genes. Like, um, your 
father gave you half of your gene and your mother gave you half of your genes. So your grandfather gave you half of your, your, your maternal grandfather gave you half of your father's half. Your paternal grandmother gave you half of your father's half. Your maternal grandfather gave you half of your mother's half. Your paternal, your maternal grandfather gave you half of your mother's half, right? So one quarter of your genome is related to each of your four grandparents, right? And so then you have eight great grandparents in, in each of them, or an eighth of your genome, right? So people who are related to you through your grandparents will have a quarter will have a quarter of your genome shared with you, right? So what kin selection has to do with is the system is optimized so that when a, a, a genome results in that genome being replicated in the environment, when you have certain genes and you have offspring and those offspring survive to reproduce, they pass on the same genes you had, right? So for instance, people who have offsprings who, whose offspring survive, those genes stay in the gene pool and then more people have those genes. But people whose relatives survive and have offspring also have more of their genes represented in the gene pool, right? Because your cousins share some genetic code with you. So what kin selection has to do with is that there are probably some biological pressures, especially in social animals like humans, which have to do not with the survival of your offspring, but the survival of your kin's offspring because your kid's offspring share your DNA, just not as much in it as your own offspring. So the reason that I'm bringing this up is at a basic Darwinian level, um, deviation from heterosexuality doesn't make, it seem to make sense, right? Because people who are not heterosexual typically don't have offspring. That's changing, but generally speaking, if they only engage in homosexual behavior, they wouldn't have offspring by virtue of that because they, they wouldn't get impregnated, right? So we know that it happens, and so there has to be an explanation for it. It has to make, it has to work together. It can't be an explanation based on their offspring, because they have less offspring than heterosexual people. The explanation is very likely to be based on kin selection. And so the idea would be that in some kind of sense, um, the, person, the person who is gay doesn't have kids of their own necessarily, or doesn't have as many kids of their own, but they increase the chances that their, sibling, their sibling's child survives, or they increase the chance that their, so this would be like their, um, their niece or nephew, or they increase the chance that their cousins survive, and those cousins pass on their genes. And so kin selection argues that the reasons the genes persist in the, in the genome is because they're copied, they're uh, replicated in these kin. And so that's probably the, the Darwinian or bio, social biological explanation of variation in, in sexual orientation. That the result is that more of your kin survive to pass on your genes. However, it's really hard to demonstrate that that's actually the case. Uh, kin selection is really hard to prove. Uh, because the, essentially because the effects get diluted because you're only passing on a small amount of your gene code. And then also, as you're passing on a smaller and smaller amount of your gene code, there is also <coughs> spontaneous genetic variation that's not inherited, and so the amount you know, further reduces as well. The reason I bring all this up is simply to mention that um, there is probably an organizational component to um, sexual orientation. There's probably an activational component. So there probably are forces that predispose inborn development of sexual orientation. There are probably also activational effects that explain why some people develop a sexual orientation later. Um, what uh, what uh, Master, I think Masters and Johnson, or maybe it was Kinsey, said is probably also likely to be true, which is that um, sexual orientation probably does exist on a continuum, uh, or, or even multiple dimensions of continuum, meaning uh, that some people have very strong sexual orientations, some people have very weak sexual orientations. Those things all seem to be valid. Those things are also things that are very poorly studied and the data from them is really inconclusive. And a lot of that data is also crap because it was um, designed to prove some kind of motivated hypothesis, like, like trying to prove that gay people were inferior or something like that. And so like that, the, that stuff you should be very cautious with, obviously, because that research was self-fulfilling. You would much like old research in IQ, which was designed to demonstrate that certain people were inferior to other people. It's a circular argument. Um, and so there's very little good data on what's going on here. 
and many of the processes are not really very well understood. But what I do want to emphasize is that there seem to be some changes in sexually dimorphic structures that are associated with sexual orientation. So I mentioned that topic briefly as well. Um, so that's reproductive behavior. Um, and it's a really interesting area. 